we have Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh in the studio with us this morning. And uh, how many years has it been that you've uh, been coming in here? It's been a long, long time. time. Yeah, ten, I, ten years. We're we're Pretty close approaching that. Yeah, yeah, yeah long well, time. Doc, Dr. Cavanaugh is a retired physician and also the founder of a, of an organization called Health Watch USA, and he also brings great guests to the show. And we've got a couple of great ones this morning. Before we get there, though, tell us about Health, Health Watch USA and what it's about. Well, Health Watch USA is a nonprofit organization which was started in Lexington in Somerset, Kentucky. It's now national in scope, and we concentrate on promoting good health care quality and also trying to concentrate on prices and seeing if we can't get affordable health care for individuals. That's a good, that's a big order. Yes. Uh, you uh, are also being published in newspapers and magazines and periodicals all over the country. I see you all the time. Well, we've had a good year this year. I don't know if that'll keep up, but uh, we have had a lot of national policies that we've been active on, and it's gotten uh, some national attention and also some international attention. And many of these policies have focused on infectious disease and the emergence of deadly pathogens and antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And that's so interesting because that just leads us right into the introduction of our guests this morning. Yes. So what I'd like to do is to introduce Dr. Stephanie Strothy, who's the Associate Dean of Global Health Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. She's also co-director of the Center of Innovative Phage Applications and Therapies. And she and her husband, uh, Dr. Tom Patterson, who's a professor of psychiatry at UC San Diego, have co-written a book. And this really describes her unbelievable struggle to save her husband's life from a highly resistant, totally resistant bacteria. And this struggle brought together three national research centers and resurrected a forgotten therapy, that of viruses or phages, which kill bacteria. And this book is just an excellent read. It's been designated by Amazon as one of the top 10 non-fictional books of 2019. And believe me, there's seldom a time when you can enjoy yourself and actually become educated about a subject. Uh, <laughs> and it's had, it, it's had tremendous reviews, and I would really encourage people to get this book. We'll and to find read out uh, before we leave you how to do it and where to do it. Yeah. Well, good morning, folks. Thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure. Good morning. We've got uh, we've got them both together. Now I notice it says in the description here the struggle that you had to save your husband's life. What about the struggle he was going through? <laughs> well, yeah, he can tell you about that. In fact, the book is the perfect predator. Scientists raced to save her husband from a deadly superbug, but my husband lived, as you can tell. Spoiler alert! Yeah. Uh, and now he takes out the garbage every time I ask him. Well, there you go. There you go. I guess you learned your lesson, didn't you? <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah, uh, that, I hope so. Tell tell us the story. Uh, how this all started? Well, it actually started in 2015, and we went to Egypt. One of those trips that uh, you do when you're getting a little older, thinking about you know filling the bucket. And we were <laughs> yeah. on our last night on a cruise down the Nile, just across in Luxor, just across from the Valley of the Kings and had a beautiful meal out on the deck of the ship and went to bed and I woke up and I was sick as a dog, throwing up, feeling terrible, and I got worse and worse and worse. But, you know, you're in a foreign country and I didn't want to go to the doctor. I'm kind of a bullheaded guy anyway, so I, doctors are I the was worst, resistant. Doctors are the worst patients. Uh, Kevin has proven that over the years. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You know, if you work in this environment, you don't want to be, <laughs> be on the other side of the bed, so right. to speak. So you didn't go to the doctor, even though they have one on board, I'm sure. Well, actually, they didn't. Oh, you they know, didn't? and this is a town that didn't have a hospital. All they had was a little clinic, and the clinic was pretty rudimentary. Oh. So my, you know, they, there was doctors in the town, and they called a doctor to the ship, they gave me IV uh, fluids and some antibiotic and said, you'll be right as rain tomorrow. Everything is going to be fine. No worries. And I just got worse and worse and worse. And so they took me into this clinic, which is a pretty scary thing to do, where nobody except the doctors speak English. You have nurses with their hijabs on, and so you can't see their faces, and you, know, you can't make any requests. And I was getting worse and worse, sicker and sicker. So 
ultimately, the uh, Stephanie, you know, as uh, you know, talk about bullheaded and, and strong-willed. She said, you know, we got to do something. We got to get you out of here. Good for her. And she, we are oh, damn right. Yeah. <laughs> Good for me. Right. <laughs> she. Uh, she managed, we had uh, travel insurance, which is one of the more important messages to give here, because for only $35, we ended up being medevaced a couple of times and had seven ambulance rides, and it cost wow. us nothing. So no kidding. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. So travel insurance is a uh, first rule of uh, thumb here. But they first medevaced me to Germany, and uh, what, it, what it turned out that I had was, I had a, um, a gallstone that had gotten into my biliary duct, which is right above your pancreas, and that created a, a big cyst is basically what it was. And that was making me sick, and the uh, German doctors removed uh, the gallstone, but I had this football-sized cyst in my gut, and they drew fluid out of it and said, hey, this hasn't just been here for a short time. This has been here for a while. It's all murky, gunky fluid. Mm. And they tested it, and it turned out that I had acquired uh, drug-resistant a, a, a bacteria called a, a Cinobacter bomaniae, Acinetobacter bomaniae, excuse me. And it was resistant to virtually all antibiotics. The Germans were scared to death because... This particular infection, when it occurred in Germany, it had closed down a couple of hospitals. Wow. Because they were, yeah, it's a scary one. So they managed to uh, put me on another plane, not with anybody else, I'll tell you. It was not the glorious, glamorous flight you might hope for. It was a tiny little Lear jet that they hopped back to San Diego. And I... Um, was dying without a doubt everybody agreed and you know they were giving up on me and that's where stephanie stepped in okay stephanie <laughs> well by the time we got tom back to san diego um his bacteria was resistant to all antibiotics um so he basically had a superbug a superbug is a bacteria that's resistant to multiple antibiotics his um it's hard to pronounce, but it, its nickname is actually Arachobacter because so many veterans come back from the Middle East with this particular pathogen that ended up being the number one most deadly superbug on the list that the World Health Organization put out. And um, our colleagues were taking care of him because we're both professors at UC San Diego, yeah. and they basically said there's nothing else that we can do. We're, we're throwing everything we can at this, and it's resistant. So um, I had this conversation with Tom where, um, you know, he was in a coma, but I was hoping that he could hear me. And I said, honey, you know, I know that you're fighting really hard and that you're doing everything you can, but the doctors have run out of solutions, and um, I need to know if, if you want to live. And if you do, please squeeze my hand, and I'll leave no stone unturned. And I waited, and uh, a minute later, he squeezed my hand really hard. And, really? Uh, of course, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, Tom will tell you that one of the, the messages of our story is, you know, he um, had an altered reality in his body while he was in a coma, but he remembers um, people talking to him, and he remembers this conversation. What he thought was going on in real life is another matter. I mean, the hallucinations are described vividly in the book because he remembers them verbatim. But at that particular moment, moment he squeezed my hand and I you know fist pumped in the air and then I thought oh crap what am I going to do now I'm not a, a medical doctor I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist uh, but I don't know how to do this and so I went home and I decided to do some research on my own on the internet the scientist version of Google is actually called PubMed. It's a search engine that the National Library of Medicine makes publicly available. So anybody can go to PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, and stick in keywords, and scientific literature will pop up. And within an hour, I found a 100-year-old forgotten cure that was only being used in parts of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And these are um, viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. They're called bacteriophage, which really means bacteria eater or phage for short and um, I thought wow you know maybe we could use this to cure Tom and 
<laughs> well, I contacted uh, our, my colleagues and I said, well, what do you think of phage therapy? I know we're going to lose Tom unless we do something drastic. And the head of infectious diseases where we work uh, said, you know, what an interesting and intriguing idea. If you can find phages that can match his bacterial pathogen, I'll call the FDA and get permission to use it on a compassionate basis, which is essentially, you know, a last resort experimental treatment when someone is dying. Wow. And so now that was the next part of the story is like, how do you find, you know, the perfect predator to, uh, you know, attack a bacteria like this? Because there's 10 million trillion trillion phages on the planet. They are actually the oldest, most ubiquitous organism on the planet. And you have to match the phage to the specific bacteria. And, you know, I didn't know where to find this. I had to wow. go back to the Internet. I made a list of phage researchers that were studying phages that attack his type of superbug. And I cold called them and said, please, please help me if you can. And Texas A&M uh, University professor Rye Young responded and said, you know, I'm the same age as your husband. Um, your story struck a chord with me. I'm going to see if I can help. Okay. And he turned his lab into a command center and uh, had a PhD student working on this around the clock. She slept in the lab. And you won't believe where they found these phages. I really appreciate it. Uh, Stephanie and Tom, good morning again, folks. Uh, these, these, uh, this couple, we got a couple of texts during the break. One said, uh, came in late. What's the name of the book? Uh, the name of the book is The Perfect Predator. And then someone also said, awesome guests. And you all, you all are awesome guests. So, well, thank you very much. So we've got a sick man that's going to die without any question unless you can find The Perfect Predator pathogen or in the in the terms of the book the perfect predator and you found that uh, at a university in texas so go back and recap that a little bit and then you're on so when Tom was dying and I turned to the Internet um, to find some solutions, um, I found this 100-year-old forgotten cure, viruses that prey upon bacteria called bacteriophage, or phage for short. And I contacted total strangers, and Texas A&M University professor Rye Young responded and said, you know, if you can send me his bacteria, I'll look and see if any of the phages that we have on hand, you know, might be a match to kill it. Um, but he also said, we'll look um, in some of the more unusual places because wherever you find a lot of bacteria, you find where the viruses that will prey upon them. So the be one of the best places to find them is actually in sewage, believe it or not. So they went through a couple hundred sewage samples and they found four phages that would kill his bacteria. And they purified them and sent them back to us. And meanwhile, uh, my colleague, the head of infectious diseases at um, University of California, San Diego, Diego, a southerner named uh, Dr. Chip Schooley, he contacted the FDA to get permission to use this experimental therapy to treat Tom, and the FDA put him in touch with another team that was working on this, and it turned out to be the U.S. Navy. Wow. And so they um, also found a phage cocktail to treat Tom's bacterial infection. So now we had two phage cocktails because you actually need more than one phage because the bacteria can mutate so rapidly that if you only have one of these little guys, it's, uh, it's not going to be enough. Now, I have never, so um, I've never, we did if I can, something if, really drastic. We injected a billion phages per dose into Tom's bloodstream. Now, we knew that this could kill him, but he was actually literally within hours of death. Mm. He was on life support. He, had, he was on the ventilator, so that meant his lungs were failing. He was on three different uh, medications to keep his heart pumping. And he, his kidneys were now failing. And I'd been asked and if I would sign the consent form for kidney dialysis the same day that we started the phage therapy. But we never needed it. He woke up from a coma three days later, lifted his head off the pillow, and kissed his daughter's hand. And everybody in the ICU freaked out. Nobody thought this guy was going to make it. Mm. And he began an essentially what was a, a, a remarkable long recovery. But now we've used this therapy to treat other people. So this is being upheld as a, a potential adjunct or even an alternative to antibiotics. Now, I have never heard of the term phage before. Would you once again explain that? Right. So phage or bacteriophage are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. They're 100 times smaller than bacteria, so you can't see them with the naked eye. They're even smaller than, you know, a regular light microscope. 
And yet they were discovered 100 years ago by a French-Canadian who had used them successfully to treat people who had bacterial infections. But when penicillin came on the scene, phage therapy was regulated to the back burner in the West, but it was taken up very vigorously in the former Soviet Union because they didn't have easy access to antibiotics. And there it's been used ever since. And so it's kind of seen as, you know, a, a standard treatment there, but not in the West because we haven't had the studies to show that it works. So it's been considered experimental treatment kind of on the fringe until my husband's case, which kind of has been considered a watershed moment that's brought it back. And we need this desperately because we're in a global crisis. Superbugs um, are in the news every single day, but by 2050, one person every three seconds is going to be dying from a superbug infection. It's because of our overuse of antibiotics. In fact, did you know that Kentucky is the state in the U.S. that actually has the, the most... Um, um, antibiotic prescribing. Yeah, I've heard that. Yep. We've, we got we've a whole bunch. About we're, that no, we're number repeatedly. one in a lot of areas we're not proud of. I yes. tell you, let's go to the uh, to the phones. And uh, our guests are, have co written the book, The Perfect Predator. Uh, John, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning. Um, yeah, this is the most fascinating show, Jack, that you've had in 10 years. Well, good. Thank you. And I've got a question for the epidemiologist um there's this there's this nano technology silver particle that is available over the counter and it coupled up with an oxygen molecule it's um in the form of a tetrahedron molecular in the molecular state and it is considered to be one of the best um, antimicrobial chemicals on the prod on the market and I'm just wondering if you have ever heard of it uh, because what it does is it boosts immunity in a natural way and they package it as a 10 parts per million colloidal solution it's really fascinating I've been using it for like a decade and I've never been sick since I started using it. Yeah, I can uh, address that. I'm not really familiar with that uh, product. But what, one of the things that this phage therapy has, uh, first of all, it's difficult to do. Uh, you know, multiple research centers, multiple phages, rummaging through sewage. It's, it's not easy. It's, it's in its infancy. But one of the things that it does is it targets specific bacteria. And that has a huge advantage. It's not like an antibiotic that completely wipes out your bacteria. In fact, one of the things that's discussed in the book was that Dr. Patterson initially took some Cipro and that, that maybe wiped out his gut bacteria and made him more susceptible. Wow. So who, who knows what happens? But this is a way that you could actually monitor and then change a person's microbiome without wiping it out. Microbiome is the healthy bacteria that you need. All you're doing here is getting rid of the pathological bacteria. So it has huge advantages over antibiotics. And unfortunately, our entire objective in the United States is to develop more antibiotics. And so far, they've spent billions of dollars. And in my opinion, have come up with pretty much squat, nothing. This is what's created the problem. It's now also fostered Candida auris, which is an antibiotic-resistant yeast infection, which is, as you know, yeast, you get that when you take antibiotics. So phage therapy, which is very targeted therapy, highly effective and has been used for years in other parts of the world, has great hopes at bringing us a, a very important weapon against these resistant bacteria. What about Dr. Stephanie, Dr. Tom? What do you, what do you guys say? Well, certainly I'm not a medical doctor, but I have heard that silver does have um, these antibiotic kinds of properties. Um, and what's interesting is that in nature is where we can find different compounds that can actually have antibacterial properties, and phage is just one of those. But um, imagine having a phage bank where we've got phages that are all isolated and characterized and sequenced and, and cleaned and ready to go. You can actually match it very quickly to a bacteria that um, is infecting somebody and within a couple of days have it ready to treat. So compare that to an antibiotic that takes 10 to 15 years to develop, maybe a billion dollars, and a lot of pharmas are moving out of the 
antibiotic development business because they're not profitable because of antimicrobial resistance. All right, uh, John, I appreciate it. Now, if we can go uh, continue on our, our story, uh, when we left, we were in the place where Tom had uh, sort of come out of his coma and kissed his daughter's hand. What happened after that? Well, Tom had a long recovery, um, but what we realized is that this had potential to treat other people. And while Tom was still in the hospital recovering, a two-year-old was treated with phage therapy intravenously and uh, as a result of Tom's case. And we both wept because we realized, you know, this is bigger wow. than us. And we felt we had an obligation to tell our story. And when Tom's a case was presented publicly for the first time at the 100th anniversary of the discovery of bacteriophage at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, the story went viral. <laughs> A good way. I mean, we had people calling us from all over the world right afterwards from China, Malaysia, Mexico, Canada, all over the U.S. saying, I have a superbug. Can this help me? And in fact, our chancellor at UC San Diego gave us some seed money to start the first phage therapy center in North America that's dedicated to treat, treating people with phages. And that's called IPATH. It's the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics. And um, we've been operating for a year. We're also trying trying to move phage into clinical trials so that if it shows that we can treat successfully um, people on a larger scale, then the FDA can license it alongside antibiotics. We don't think it's ever going to be a replacement for antibiotics, but in Tom's case and others, we've even seen that phage can make antibiotics work again. Mm. Well, wow, that, that is so cutting edge and, and so huge. Oh, yeah. uh, someone uh, writes uh, on our text line, so less antibiotics and more probiotics? Well, certainly probiotics these days have bacteria in them, and some even have phage in them. But with phage, you need to match it to the specific bacteria that you're trying to kill. And so we don't know enough about phage yet to promote specific phage products that could be included in probiotics. But that's certainly an area of research that is being worked on these days, is to see whether or not we can use phage to groom the microbiome to get rid of the nasty bacteria and just keep the healthy ones. So you know, this is a, a really exciting line of research. A, certainly a global village stepped up to help save my husband's life. We had friends and family that we want to acknowledge. In fact, my former student, Dr. Jennifer Havens, uh, is at the University of Kentucky there in Lexington. Mm -hmm. And special shout out to her for sending me a very nice big bottle of Kentucky bourbon that I needed while Tom was in the hospital for nine months. Someone else has written in says, awesome guest this morning. For those of us who are allergic to many antibiotics, a must read. Yeah, this is, I think, a, just a fascinating book, very educational. And a, a lot of the details are being left out of this show. You know, for example, the cleansing of the phages is difficult to do because these gram negative bacteria release a toxin when they die, and you have to grow the phages in bacteria so that this toxin has to be removed. And so that there is a lot of steps that have to be done. But certainly this is an area that I think that should be targeted to try to rejuvenate antibiotics. And it was st stated by our speakers, these can cause reactivation of antibiotics. And it does this by morphing or changing the bacteria. As the bacteria evolves, it's shedding its antigens, it's shedding its coat, it's shedding its skin so the phages can't attack it. Well, when it does that, it's removing some of the protective layers that it uses to resist antibiotics and mm. so that antibiotics can become more susceptible. It's kind of like being shot with two different things at the same time. It's hard to resist both. You can choose one or the other. Yeah. And so th this has tremendous potential. Again, it needs to get a lot of funding. We need to refocus off of things that can generate large income and patents and all of this uh, barriers and, and look at developing different avenues to approach our antibiotic resistant problem and epidemic in an entirely different way. The title of the book, in case you missed it, is The Perfect uh, Predator and where and how can we, where can we get it? Uh, I bought mine at Amazon. The hardback edition at the time I bought it was actually $12. It was cheaper than even the online Edition And as I stated before, Amazon just ranked this the top 10 uh, non-fictional read uh, for 2019. Amazing. So, I mean, it is an excellent, uh, it's an excellent book. I mean, it's one of the few books that I, I could not put down. 
That's great. Yeah. Now, uh, how long did it take Tom to actually recover? Well, Tom, why don't you join in on that one? Yeah. Well, let's first say that if I had received phages early on in my illness, I'd been out of the hospital in no time. It was three months before I even got the phages. By that time, I had lost 100 pounds, all of my muscle mass. I couldn't talk. I couldn't walk. I couldn't swallow. All of my functions were down. So I was in the hospital for nine months, had a lot of ups and downs, but... Like I say, had I received phages early on, I wouldn't have had that problem. So the rule of thumb is it's five times as long to recover as the time you've been in the hospital. So it's about four years to recover from nine months in the hospital. So I had to learn to walk again, talk again, and I'm back to work and running around, getting in trouble again. I, I'm doing very well. I had no side effects from the phages. Amazing. Yeah. I, and, and you don't have to answer this question, but I'm just curious. As I stated before in the introduction, we also deal with costs. Um, do you have any idea what the cost of the care was? To uh, uh, My cost, the cost of my care was clearly enormous. I don't know the amount. I, mean, I like was it's in very, billions? very fortunate <laughs> to have very good insurance. And a lot of what, you know, was done for me by the Navy, by Texas A&M, by San Diego State, who cleaned the phages. All of that was done gratis. That was free. And, you know, it isn't like you can determine what the real cost it would be for phage therapy from my case. I was privileged to receive the global effort to save my life. I mean, phages came from all over the world, ultimately, to save me. And doctors and researchers all came together, including the FDA, who normally people think of as the people who don't help. They were very helpful in, wow. in pulling together and identifying people who could help, the Navy in particular. So what I would say is my case was a groundbreaking breaking case, and hopefully people won't be afraid of viruses like I was. I'm an AIDS researcher, and I always thought viruses, bad things. And what it turns out is some viruses are actually helpful. Uh, everybody's saying, love these guests, uh, great guests, wonderful show. Thanks for setting this thing up. And take over from here. we got about uh, six minutes. Well, no. Well, thank you very much, Jack. This is a very important presentation. I yes, think the it other is. thing that it does is underscores that this is not a facility problem. Its solutions aren't going to be at the facility level, and we really need to have a much better national tracking system for these deadly pathogens, and we need to have pathogens reported in numbers, not epidemics. We need to know how many cases, where these pathogens are, so you can better gather phages, look for cures, and do adequate research. A facility is not going to solve this by simply doing antiseptic, deep room cleaning, et cetera. There are many things that need to go on, and it needs to be a coordinated national effort. Okay, if you can conclude your story here for us, how would you do it? Well, I mean, certainly Tom lived, but our book is really more about the how, not the what. And there's messages in there for all of your listeners, because we can't just treat our way out of this global problem of superbug crisis. We need to reduce our use of antibiotics, not just in people, but in livestock. I mean, Kentucky is a big producer of broiler chickens and beef and cows and pork. And so we really need to work with farmers to reduce antibiotics. In fact, phage can even be potentially used to replace antibiotics antibiotics given to livestock. So that's a, an area for the future. Now, Kentucky is also um, the biggest antibiotic user in the whole of the United States. So folks, well, you have purchasing power. You can buy meat that is antibiotic free and it even tastes better. So that's another message for you. But if you have a superbug and it's not responding to any antibiotics, you can contact us at ipath at ucsd.edu. That's ipath at ucsd.edu. We'll, we'll try to help you. Phage therapy is experimental, so it's reserved only for life-threatening cases right now. But we're trying to move this research forward into clinical trials so that it can help other people around the world. And do you think as you look into your crystal ball that in the future that's exactly what's going to happen? 
Well, we certainly hope so. Many people have been treated around the world as a result of Tom's case intravenously with phage. Um, it saved the leg of a, of a man um, in Minnesota recently, and he had 19 operations on his leg. And after two infusions of phage, I called him on the phone to, to see how he was doing, and he was out there mowing the lawn. Wow. It's P-H-A-G-E, by the way. Phage. That's right. P-H-A-G-E. Yeah. Um, it's like phone. We yeah, laugh. yeah. I am sorry, Tom, that you had to go through this, but I am very, very thankful, the, uh, obviously, and you are too, for your wife who uh, wouldn't let you die. And, Stephanie, as a result of that, um, there are going to be a whole lot of people that won't die. And I can't uh, tell you, I don't think I've ever had guests on the show of this magnitude before, but it's really amazing, and, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys getting up early to be with us this morning. Well, it's been a real pleasure, and if I can end on a, a humorous note, I can literally tell my husband that he's full of you-know-what, because you remember <laughs> where pages are from. <laughs> you know, Tom, I have, to, I have to say this. I believe she's a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> well, I chose wisely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys very much. And uh, once again, before we leave, The Perfect Predator is the title of the book. And uh, tell us how we can get it. You can go to theperfectpredator.com, uh, where you'll find more about our story. You can see photos and um, read articles and purchase the book there as well. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Five minutes now before 10. Got about a minute left. Uh, tell us uh, anything going on that we need to know about in terms of Health Watch USA? Well, October 17th, we're going to have our annual conference, and we have a, another author that will be presenting there regarding the deadly river, the cholera outbreak in Haiti. should be very interesting. And go to healthconference.org to register and reserve a spot. And basically, you, uh, you do all that work, don't you? Myself and my family, and we do have a few volunteers that, that help out. Must too. be quite a passion, though. Well, we've been doing it for almost 15 years now, yeah. so it's, uh, it is, and uh, we've been making some policy headways, which I think is very good nationally, and try to push forward and improve health care in Kentuckians and the whole nation. Well, we're thankful for you, Kevin, and thank you very much for being with us and, well, thank and you for arranging having us. this guest. We'll get you back you. soon.